Okay, I'm gonna ask everyone introduce themselves and what state they're from. So I'm Dominique Marslek, Government Affairs Specialist for the American Counseling Association. Um, please introduce yourself as well. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. David Julius Ford Jr., pronounce he, him, and his. And I am calling you from Ocean, New Jersey, on the beautiful Jersey Shore. Oh, great. Lane Madsen, I am um, South Dakota Counseling Association president. I'm calling from Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, pronouns she and her. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Talina Landestoy. First time joining the ACA Power Hour. I wasn't prepared to say anything, um, but I can introduce myself. I am an APC and certified alcohol and drug counselor, national certified counselor, and I'm from Georgia. Okay, great. So we have Georgia, New Jersey, South Dakota. Um, anyone else on the line? Uh, my name is Kitty Fallon. I'm also a first time person on the call and I'm from New Mexico. Great. Susan Carmichael, I'm with Georgia. Oh, great. Hello, I'm Caroline Brackett. I am um, in Georgia. I'm actually a past president of the ACA of Georgia. Oh, great. Thank you for joining. Okay, I'm gonna start calling folks, calling on folks. Let's see. Uh, Dr. Cox, do you, would you like to introduce yourself? She might not be at the computer screen. That's Maryland. Um, Hi. Oh, great. Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, sorry about that. Um, pulling up to my house. Hi, everybody. I'm um, Janelle, Dr. Janelle Cox, um, assistant professor at Bowie State University in Maryland. Um, LCPC as well in Maryland, and um, excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Okay, Dr. Fallon, did you introduce yourself? Yes, I did. I'm from New Mexico. Oh, great. Yes, you did. Okay. Anyone else going once, twice? I'm Wallace McCormick. I'm from Mississippi, president-elect uh, for MCA in Mississippi, and representing all those folks today. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so the agenda for today is uh, pretty simple. Um, I'm going to do a brief PowerPoint on the Counseling Compact. Some of this information you will have heard before, um, you know, part of uh, the advocacy with the Compact is just repeating the information, um, and ensuring we have clarity on the basics um, we're going to have a brief presentation or um, conversation with Georgia and Maryland. Georgia, uh, Dr. Dickerson will be on around 3.20. Um, and she only has about 10 minutes of her time today between meetings. Um, so she'll talk briefly about uh, the Georgia successes, lessons learned, and then we might be able to get a question or two in. Um, and then Maryland, um, they were kind enough to send me a pre-recorded 10-minute uh, um, presentation on how advocacy went for them. Um, and then afterwards, we'll uh, loop back around on some uh, counseling comeback basics and then do a QA. and a um, And of course, uh, state updates, you know, from your end, if there's anything advocacy or uh, policy specific you wanted to talk about. So I'm gonna do a brief PowerPoint here. And everyone can see that. Okay. Okay. So some brief background and history on the Counseling Compact. 
In January of 2019, ACA entered into an agreement with the National Center for Interstate Compacts to facilitate and implement the Interstate Compact. By October of 2019, we had uh, convened an advisory group to work on the compact language. Um, by March of 2020, we were having drafting team meetings uh, and creating drafts of the actual language. By summer of 2020, we had stakeholder feedback periods. Uh, so that was several months where we reached out to branches, regions, counseling organizations, um, state, uh, state boards, um, and experts in the field for their feedback um, and engaged in countless uh, drafts and edits uh, to ensure we really had the best language possible. Um, by fall of 2020, we revised the draft um, and went through another couple final drafts with the advisory group and settled on a final language by the end of the year. Um, by January of this year, we had our target states identified and we began reaching out to state legislatures. So what is the compact? The compact really briefly and very simply is a legislative process to allow counselors to practice across state lines. It is based on the mutual recognition model um, and it establishes the requirements and duties for states to participate in the compact while delineating the structure for oversight. What does a compact do? The compact, the counseling compact will allow counselors to obtain a privilege to practice in another state, so long as that state is a member of the compact. It will provide an expedited mechanism for obtaining a new license when the home state changes, if that state is a member of the compact. It allows military personnel and spouses to designate a home state and provides the privilege to practice uh, through telehealth modalities. So to establish the compact, we need 10 states to trigger establishment. That means 10 states have to pass the bill language through their legislatures prior to enactment of the compact and the creation of the commission. The commission will be comprised of a board member from each participating state and this will also um, trigger the development of the national data system, um, which will uh, track in real time um, licensure information um, and any, um, any necessary red flags for, for counselors. Um, and of course, uh, rulemaking by the commission. So current status, uh, in 2021, we were really excited to finally begin to hit the ground running uh, with legislatures. Of course, uh, we did this in the midst of a public health epidemic on, on multiple levels and, and, and in multiple fronts, including COVID-19. Um, so we were dealing with legislatures that were very restricted in how um, they were handling legislation, testimony, um, and uh, even their timeline often was expedited um, or um, uh, limited uh, in order to deal with the crisis and focus mainly on COVID-19. But despite this, we were able to successfully introduce the bill in legislatures this year. So of course you've heard the news 2021 passage, Georgia and Maryland uh, successfully passed the compact so far out of their legislatures. Uh, in the past week, uh, the Georgia governor uh, signed the bill into law. Um, we have expectations that that will happen for Maryland in the next month. We received uh, in the past week notification that North Carolina um, successfully introed the bill in their state legislatures. Um, and we have the bill pending in, uh, well, we have the bill pending in Tennessee and Nebraska um, and in drafting in Delaware. Um, so what does that mean? Drafting means we've identified a sponsor and that the bill is being written up in the legislature, but it has not yet been assigned to committee. It has not yet been introduced into the formal uh, process. Um, Tennessee and Nebraska, the bills were introduced. Um, Tennessee um, and Nebraska, both the bills were put on hold in committee um, with the hope of being reintroduced um, in 2022. Um, with a lot of the work already uh, laid out and accomplished. 
So looking ahead, um, we have a sponsor successfully identified in Louisiana. We have our key states established um, for the coming year. Um, and we are working on our advocacy for 2022 with key states uh, through monthly meetings and regular outreach. If you're interested um, in finding out more, you can go to counselingcompact.org. There you'll find letters of support and, and those can serve as templates because we are taking letters of support from branches, organizations, and universities. You'll find talking points for legislative outreach to possible sponsors, state boards, and your members. Um, you'll find a map for tracking legislation, as well as the final, final bill language. Um, we did amend the bill language once, uh, one more time um, in January uh, to reflect a technical change based on conversations with uh, the Maryland legislature. So you want to be sure to have the final, final language. We need uh, the bills to be the same um, in order for the, the, the contract uh, to work. Um, so bill language, infographics, uh, so neat little easy to follow infographics to provide your members and uh, provide your representatives and handouts uh, that you can just uh, print out to take with you when you're meeting with your representatives. If you have questions at any point, Dan Logston is our key contact at the National Center for Interstate Compacts. Uh, he is one of the leading, um, if not the leading, um, subject matter expert on compacts uh, in the United States. Um, we have Dr. Lynn Lindy, of course, you know her, uh, who is our, uh, who is the project manager here at ACA for the compact. And then myself, um, I am the policy specialist uh, for the compact in terms of advocacy. So that's our brief run through um, and it looks like, okay, 316. Do we have Dr. Dickerson on the phone? No. Okay, so we'll keep going. So more information, just a little bit more in depth. What is the counseling compact? Um, occupational compacts are the most powerful and durable legislative tools interested in multi-state cooperation. That's a huge sentence. It's very packed, uh, full of meaning. Um, and I say this often because uh, the more we get into the advocacy weeds and legislatures, the more important these words are. They're kind of keywords or buzzwords to use with your um, member. Um, Part, uh, part of this language will help you differentiate what the difference between a compact and reciprocity. Um, so a lot of bills, particularly in rural states and particularly in states where um, they're engaged in uh, deregulating the profession a little bit in order to increase access or they're really looking into reciprocity. Um, this is important to note with them. Occupational compacts are the most powerful and durable legislative tools for states interested in multi-state cooperation. Um, reciprocity um, is sort of a short-term solution uh, to an immediate problem, whereas the compact is a durable, sustainable legislative tool that we foresee uh, being around, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, um, 50, 60, 70, 80 years into the future. We're hoping the compact really changes the way we engage in um, counseling. So while utilizing the constitutional authority of states to determine policy apart from the federal government's Interstate compacts, like the Counseling Compact, provide a state-based solution for multi-state policy that requires regional and national consensus building. Uh, so state-based, that means, of course, that we don't um, interfere with the state's uh, scope, uh, practice act or um, scope of practice. That's really important for members and representatives. Um, they're going to want to know this. They often are going to need to hear it multiple times. Um, so it's really important to, for them to know. This does not usurp state authority. Um, it uh, relies on a mutual recognition model um, in which the State Practice Act in each state retains their own um, um, local uh, culture and their own local language. So the Counseling Compact, again, is a mutual recognition model in which a practitioner's home state license is mutually recognized by other compact member states 
based on the set of criteria laid out within the language of the compact. Um, so a practitioner's home state is defined as your primary state of residence. This is a public safety um, issue um, and uh, makes it a lot easier to get the compact through legislatures. Uh, representatives are going to have a preference for that. Um, and again, it, it's a, it allows the state to retain uh, their, their jurisdiction and um, their uh, local authority. This model allows counselors to practice in compact metaverse states, either in person or, or through telebehavioral health. Um, again, this enhances um, practice by uh, including the telebehavioral health modality. Rulemaking compliance to the compact and specifications of the privilege to practice will be overseen by an independent interstate commission. The commission will be comprised of delegates from each member state to administer the compact. And the efforts will be aided by a modernized uh, licensure data system for compact member state boards uh, to exchange information on licensure, disciplinary actions, and necessary updates in real time. So the compact creates a shared interstate licensure data system uh, that allows for near instant verification of licensure status. Uh, that means um, rapid uh, licensure status verification, um, which is uh, incredibly important for uh, counseling today. Um, through the data system, the privilege of, to practice can be obtained in a matter of minutes. Um, and of course, the data system enhances public protection by ensuring that member states share investigative and disciplinary information with one another in real time. So there's not um, that time lapse or gap in information that often allows um, uh, counselors who are, are not um, adhering to maybe ethical practice or our standards um, to simply move to another state or, or um, fly under the radar. Um, we do not anticipate substantial additional costs for states participating in the compact. Again, the compact is meant to be revenue neutral and cost neutral. Um, so any administrative fees uh, through the commission uh, will be just to offset the cost of the compact itself. It is not a revenue generator. Let me see here. Uh, Dr. Dickerson, are you on the line yet? No, I don't see her. Okay, I'll continue. So how does it benefit counselors? Um, I know I went through this, but I want to be a little bit more specific here. Um, removing barriers to practice and improving access to services. Um, it streamlines the application pro process with rapid licensure verification, authorizes telebehavioral health modalities, enhances mobilities, and supports military families. So uh, we know that active military personnel are often exempt from certain regulations. Um, this extends uh, the same courtesy to military families in that it, it allows for that continuity of lifestyle. Um, the Department of Defense strongly supports compacts for this reason. Um, military families move often, and oftentimes um, they have to start over with their job, with their counseling, with their um, uh, careers and their lives. Um, this allows a continuity of lifestyle, as well as a continuity of care for the most vulnerable, um, for everyone, but also for the most vulnerable, um, you know, the dis uh, disability community, uh, senior citizens, folks who do not have as much, um, uh, as much of an ability to travel or uh, continually look for care and services. This allows a continuity of care that really will enhance their life. Um, and strengthening of state licensure systems, that's particularly important for those states that really do care about that sort of public safety mechanism. So to become eligible for a privilege to practice, your home state has to become a member of the compact. It has to pass the compact through their legislature. Once your state becomes a member, professional counselors may ap apply for a privilege to practice if they hold an active, unencumbered license in their home state to practice independently. I get a lot of questions about how, what do, who does the compact apply to? Um, does it apply to um, LMFTs, um, LPCs, um, or various titles? Um, it's really about uh, the language of the compact. So if you are a professional counselor in your state, um, if you hold an active unencumbered license, and if you can practice independently, then the compact will apply to you. 
A privilege to practice uh, allows the counselor to provide professional telebehavioral health services where the client uh, in another member state under the scope of practice determined by the state where the client is located. So the scope of practice is determined by the state where the client is located. Again, that's a public safety issue um, and it's just standard best practices for compacts. Uh, Dr. Dickerson, are you on the line? I am. Oh, great. I'd love to hear. Um, so we're going to hear for a few minutes from Dr. Dickerson, who's going to walk us through our very successful campaign in Georgia um, and talk a little bit about lessons learned. So I'll, I'll say uh, we have to give credit, uh, as difficult as it is, to um, another state organization that we have, not full credit, but partial credit, to another state organization in Georgia, um, LPC. AGA, um, because as, although they started it, they made it a, a tad difficult for us to get involved. Um, when we started uh, with ACA of Georgia getting involved, we found out that LPC AGA had already started the process. But the way that I found that out was through contacting my state representative, Jasmine Clark, and having her dig a little deeper to um, find out what was already in place and who at the time she was starting to find out who she could have as co-sponsors for the bill and then she found out that the bill was already there that the sponsor was the guy's name who I can't remember in Buckhead and that LPCA GA had already been in contact with him but um, she did also help me with uh, starting to show up and give you know say hey ASA of Georgia's here this is who we are and then of course we brought in Dominique who had all the other contacts to get us, um, to help us be a part of the process and just get us at the table. So then there were questions and again, LPCA had already gotten it set up as uh, House Bill 395, but ACA of Georgia was able to come in and testify on the bill. Um, there were some questions and ACA answered some of those questions. I don't know what LPCA did besides take pictures saying that they answered questions, but they were there as well. And um, it passed in the House and then passed in the Senate after it passed. It had to pass through a whole lot of different committees, y'all. All these, y'all find out all what all committees have to be involved in this and then um, the governor had more questions, I believe, and eventually he signed it. Now that took a while, but what we do know about Georgia is that in order for a bill to not pass in Georgia, he has to actively veto it. So if he had not signed it in 40 days, it was going to pass anyway. Another thing about it was, although it passed in the Senate, they did not get it on the governor's desk for another couple of weeks. So as we were trying to get in contact with the governor's office about being present for the picture of the bill signing, um, they said they didn't know when the bill signing was because I guess they didn't have the bill on their desk. Later on, they decided that this one was not important enough for bill signing, but he did sign it just a couple of days ago. So we know what happened on our end. We don't know all of what happened in the background. ACA of Georgia was very much involved. LPCA of Georgia was also very much involved. As much as they didn't want us to be involved, we still work together. And we now have a somewhat of a relationship, I'm going to say in air quotes, with our LPCA of Georgia, who is our, they, they're our state branch of AMCA. And the way that we were able to get a little better communication is partially from um, me getting in contact with the AMCA CEO and president, like get your people under control. Uh, but also I brought them some cupcakes. And so they were a little nicer after the cupcakes because cupcakes solve everything. And that's it. I think that leaving thing out, Dominique. No, um, and you know, Georgia, you know, every state's really unique. So Georgia's a great example. Um, you were talking about how um, it had to go through kind of a lot of in the weeds processes between passing in the House and the Senate. 
one thing that Georgia had that maybe other states might not and some states will is it had to pass through Gork, which is the governor's uh, regulatory council and be approved um, at the same time that it was going through the legislature. Um, so we had to sort of keep our eyes on all those votes happening at the same time. Um, and Asia helped me do that. And, uh, and part of that was, was going up there face to face because you could not get an answer via e emails and phone calls were ignored. And so there were a few days where I just forked over the $15 for parking and waited for somebody to come out and see me. And once you're up there, they're very nice. They'll talk to you, but they don't respond to emails. Yeah, so, you know, that you touched on something really important that during COVID has been really hard is that sometimes we, we do have success, but sometimes we're really limited by not being able to go in, por in person. So you going in person was really, um, I think, very important to us getting, um, even just a little bit of recognition um, in the legislature, even getting a response and getting key contacts um, and policy names and phone numbers and things like that. I think um, it's just really hard if you can't actually go in person. So I think it's um, it was really important that you did that. Does anyone mm -hmm. have any questions for Dr. Dickerson before she hops off for her um, next uh, meeting? I, I don't have a question, but Aisha, hi, this is Caroline. I just hi. want to say, <laughs> Um, you know, having been at the beginning of that ACA of Georgia and LPCGA um, dynamic, I, I just want to say I appreciate you and your efforts because I don't know if people know there are two counseling associations in Georgia and sometimes there can be territorial wars, but I appreciate you having that where we have the same goal. We're working towards the same thing. Let's work together. And so thank you for your leadership. You're welcome. Thank you. And Diana, I do have the answer. What LPCA of GA did um, was the same thing that I started, which was getting in contact with their representative. So they they just needed a house representative to, to be willing to sponsor the bill, which is what my representative was going to do. And then doing that, she found out that someone else had already started that process. So that's that's step number one is finding someone who's willing to handle it. And they don't have to write anything from scratch. We already have something written up. Yeah. And I mean, how do you feel? Uh, Georgia is the first state to sign it uh, into law. It's good for the counseling compact. Um, but also, you know, I know Georgia, one day we're up, one day we're down. So yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what the next thing is going to be that they're going to help us with or, you know, where they're going to try to harm us. I do like that uh, the governor still signed it because there was some pushback. Of course, there are always a few people who don't want counselors to be able to practice across state lines. They don't want us to have the same privileges to practice that they do. But um, the military, uh, Department of Defense was also very much involved in helping him understand how important this compact was. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to respect your time. So anytime you have to jump off, please, uh, please do. Okay. They haven't called yet, but when they did, when they do, <laughs> I'll jump off. But to, um, to answer your other question, Diana, no, the licensure board was not involved. Now, Georgia's licensure board is a little different than some others, and that our licensure board is a part of the Secretary of State's office. We don't have a whole separate, I mean, it is a separate board, but our Secretary of State's office handles licensure for every uh, profession. And so they they can barely approve licenses these days. They're about three yeah. months behind, so they weren't going to get involved. Yeah, I have yeah. a question. Um, I still don't understand how much different is it from reciprocity? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, so we got two questions. We got the reciprocity question, which I can take um, if you don't want to, Dr. Dickerson. Um, you can answer that one. Yeah. And then Susan wanted to know, um, how did we get the DOD involved? You want, okay, so how do you get the DOD involved in Georgia? And I'm guessing it's probably similar in other states. Is find out who the committee chairs are um, for different, well, there's, not Department of Defense Committee, but there is a committee that focuses on military affairs. 
And um, that's what I would do from this part, but also the way we really got the Department of Defense involved was through Dominique because she knows everybody. And so she found out who the person was from the Department of Defense who um, would who was in communication with the people in Georgia. Dominique knows everybody. <laughs> uh, I just have the information. I don't. I, I wish I knew them in person, but with COVID, <laughs> it's not possible. Um, yeah. So the Department of Defense were really lucky because um, as Compax has picked up steam in the last few years, uh, they really actually have their own sort of cabinet of folks whose job it is to uh, testify in support of compacts they approve in the United States uh, divided by region. So we uh, will just help you kind of loop them in. Um, and then, uh, you know, if, if there's any issue, you know, we'll help kind of facilitate conversations and just um, help keep them as part of our team. And it, it's really helpful because sometimes like in Georgia, when there's local level politicking happening, having the DOD just uh, reach out for you or with you can um, get people to be a little bit more responsive. Um, and, and another thing about LPCFGA is they have lobbyists that they pay to be up there for a lot of other bills, I guess. So if, if your state organization does not have a lobbyist, that's why it, it's helpful to just be up there yourself. Yes, and it's really powerful. In person, it's just, it's just so much harder for them. Um, one, part of the non-responsiveness is they're busy. Some of it sometimes is politicking. Um, but it's just harder for them to ignore constituents that actually show up in person. They just um, are less likely to do that. Yeah, I mean, um, it really is like what you see on TV where you're just like, hey, hey, <laughs> Senator such and such. My name is Asia. And you try to hurry up and say what you need yeah. to say. Yeah, it really is. Um, so did you feel like economic advantages for counselors were, was a factor um, or being able to extend practice out of state? Did you feel like um, that was a factor at all in Georgia? No. So I, I think that was a, one of the reasons that other people did not want us to have the compact because they were thinking about where money would be taken out of their pockets. Um, but I, I, I can only speak for uh, myself and my understanding from the government um, officials who were involved is that uh, the biggest factors were helping the community for our military members and their family members who um, move here and there and don't wanna keep changing counselors for people. Um, I keep saying, I, I live in Gwinnett County and very diverse and you know we can have a translator from another state or there is probably a counselor somewhere in another state who speaks that person's native language. So the counseling compact will assist with that. I think those were the main factors. Nobody mentioned money when it came to this is one of the reasons we should get it passed. We weren't thinking it was going to bring any more money into Georgia. Yeah, and uh, that's just another interesting example of how every state's different. Um, for some states, you know, money will really be a factor. Um, like Maryland, it was an issue. We had to have several conversations. Um, for other states, you know, public safety might be an, uh, an, of an interest, but for some states, it's not at all necessarily the key driver. Um, so it just depends on on what's what the local community cares most about. Um, in Georgia, yeah, the military was a really big factor for them and, and um, being able to um, support the military. Um, any other, I'm gonna hold on to the reciprocity question and circle back around to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but any other Georgia specific questions for Dr. Dickerson? Um, Dr. Yeah. Dickerson, how, how are you doing? So good to Hi, see you. Hi, Dr. Ford. Wonderful um, to hear your voice. Likewise, likewise, man. So I'm in New Jersey, and you know we've been talking about it here in um in in the in the NAR region. What would be some tips that you would give to us, you know, to kind of you know start the conversation here, um, in in Jersey because we don't have any contacts with anybody, and um. We're, we're often, we're, we're part of the tri-state area with, with Pennsylvania and New York, but some of the issues with New York is that no matter how long you've been licensed, they're going to make you take um, the, L the NCM ACE. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what can we do to kind of get the conversation started and also to assist other states in the NAR region? Because we, 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 we haven't done anything towards the compact yet. 
and and see my presidency ends um um in the end, end of june but i still want to be at the forefront of helping to get this passed for new jersey because it would, it would be a game changer for us so mm-hmm. what would be some some tips that you would give to us as for you and for, and for dominique too to kind of like you know get this conversation started so that we've done a, the legwork to um kind of get the government portion done for the compact hope that makes mm-hmm. sense it, it makes sense. Um, I would suggest that you start to research, again, what, what committees there are in, in the House, in the Senate, in your state, and find out which committees best fit the, the goal for the compact. I would think it would be the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, anybody who's um, involved with the military. And I mean, we, we could look at who's the the chair of that committee, but they're usually like super busy. So and when I was first looking, especially thinking about my own um, state rep, is I was looking for someone who has not really had a chance to sponsor a bill yet. And so they're looking to get their name out there and do something important. And it's not something that they have to write from scratch um, and reach out to them, send an email. A lot of times they're, they'll respond because they're just like, give me a chance to be important, especially the brand new ones. So reach out and see if they're interested. Once um, stuff is in place, it's a lot of calling and emails to be sent from the counselors in your state to their state representatives and to to their um, senators about supporting whatever it is you all end up presenting. And, and I think it matters like when your um, when your legislature meets as well, because yeah. I know there are yeah. some who have these early meetings and they're done and, you know, they won't be meeting again until January and stuff like that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that was a great point. Um, and, you know, if you if you reach out in those states where it's a little harder, maybe you don't have as much of a history with compacts. Um, if you reach out to the chair of your health committee and you can't get a response um, and you want to start with your local elected, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, the, the sponsor. Um, it, maybe your representative might have a better um, understanding of who would be a good sponsor, or maybe you can get uh, the conversation going in the legislature. So um, for example, in North Carolina, the representative who actually did a lot of the work with the DOD to sort of hash out the language and get the draft introduced um, is not the lead sponsor on the bill in the end. They chose someone else based off of whatever's going on in North Carolina, the person that they wanted to be the lead sponsor at the end of the day. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, So any um, Dr. Dickerson specific questions? Um, I think maybe she might have time for like one more. Um, We're really lucky that you squeezed us in today because I know you're, you have so many things going on. I I have a question. Um, When you get a privilege to practice license in a compact state, does the state board recognize you it, it, by calling you privileged to practice in addition to LPC or, or whatever the full license is in your state? Is that designated on the website so a consumer can look and see that you are licensed in the state, but you have privilege to practice that you're not living there, for instance? Is there a designation like that or is there a need for a designation like that? I don't think we've gotten to that point where there's a designation since we don't have a compact and there's, and and so I'm not even sure there would be one yet. I don't think we're that far in, but I imagine that, I mean, for myself seeing clients, if I wanted to see clients in another state that were, and they were a part of the compact, I would still list my, I mean, you're still just licensed in your state, but this um, states that I'm licensed in and maybe note somewhere else that I have the privilege to practice in these okay. other states in case they see you when they like you. Yeah, I often say Dr. Dickerson could do, could lead some of our advocacy. She's this amazing PowerPoint on the compact. And that was just a good answer because that's exactly what I would say is that um, right now that's not really um, that's a question you want to keep in your mind and we want to keep um, uh, the present for when the commission is formed. So once the commission is formed, they'll be doing local rulemaking um, and helping get the database up and running um, and sort of hashing out those details of how do they 
um, label things or title things and, and where do they put the information and what information are they sharing and with whom. Okay. Well, Dr. Dickerson, thank you so much for your time today. I'm so yes, appreciative. Thank you for having me. You, most of you know how to get in contact with me if you need to um, in the future, but I'll put my email address in the chat in case you want to. Don't, please don't be offended if it takes me a week to respond. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And um, while Dr. Dickerson is doing that, I'm going to turn uh, to our uh, pre-recorded uh, advocacy message from Maryland who also successfully passed uh, the compact um, and that will have a lot of great information for you. Hello everyone. Sorry I couldn't be with you live, but I'm out of town and i actually, as this is airing, I'm going, I would be in the air um, on a plane. So my name is Ronnie White. I am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Maryland. I am a member of ACA and a member of the Maryland Counseling Association. I serve as the chairperson for the advocacy committee with MCA. So this year has been an exciting year and um, we have done a lot of advocacy in the state of Maryland in, with our state legislature. Some of that has been around and a lot of it has been around the counseling compact, which has been led, the efforts have been led by ACA um, with a great team, especially um, with Maryland and with Dominique, um, who many of you I'm sure know. And the materials that have been supplied from ACA have been incredibly helpful and we have used them, them to help our members understand what the Counseling Compact is about and how they can speak with elected officials on behalf of the Counseling Compact. And this, the materials really help the members speak with comfort and with confidence. So this year, we also hosted our Hill Day, what we call an Advocacy Day, virtual due to all the natures and precautions with the pandemic. So what we did was we contacted um, all of the, our elected officials in the state of Maryland, which we have, um, there are over 200 um, <laughs> elected officials combining the, the state house and the state senate. And we encouraged them to be part of our advocacy day by signing up for time slots. And we posted it through Zoom. Time slots were either 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And then we tried to pair members that were in their district or just that were available during that time to sit with us and speak with the elected officials. So we spoke about various bills and we also focused on the counseling compact, as well as the telehealth bills that were in both the state house and the Senate house. So during this time, uh, we talked through the necessary um, reasons why the counseling compact needs to be supported, who we would benefit, how we would benefit, um, how professionals, counselors would find it useful, and then and highlighting the needs in, in the state of Maryland as well as across the country. The elected officials were really engaged with us and were thankful for our professionalism, for our knowledge, and for our time. And we were also thankful of theirs. So it was a huge success on the actual day that we designated for Advocacy Day, we met with over 42 elected officials, which also included their, their staff. And I would like to say, and I'm happy to say that the Counseling Compact did pass both our State House and our um, State Senate and went to the governor's desk. And we're still waiting for the governor to sign it. And we do know that the governor is in full support of it. Um, ACA led the way of meeting with the governor's office and different members also have met with or sent in testimony to the governor's office. And the advocacy team also wrote letters 
in support of the Delta Compact to the governor's office. We supply our membership with templates to be able to write, whether it's testimony or letters of support. We also provided um, up-to-date information to our members. We kept them informed via email, via weekly blast, uh, via Twitter, and on our website. And we kept the templates available in email and on the website, so it was just easier for them to access and for them to see it. We also did ways where the members were able to send the letters back to us on the advocacy committee, and then the advocacy committee recompiled the letters, and whether we sent them to Dominique to submit or we submitted them, um, depending on which stage we were in and what um, we were advocating for. So Hilde, our Hill Day, which we know as Advocacy Day, was a, just an incredible success with the advocacy team really working together, getting the word out to both the elected officials and to the MCA membership, as well as easing um, the way in order to sign up for Advocacy Day, both for the elected officials, just having to deal with a small team of signing up the times and us organizing the platform, to the members of just needed to say that, yes, they wanted to take part in it, in it and what times they would be available. And then we did all of the coordination um, for it to happen. We needed to have it, the advocacy team. Advocacy team. Um, additionally, we um, worked together to, to write um, other letters of support and we're looking forward, you know, down the road, we know this housing compact is going to happen as more states are coming on board, and Georgia and Maryland are the first two that is a detriment. And so looking forward and looking into um, 2022, we're constantly going to advocate for our profession, both with um, how our license is recognized on all aspects of mental health, including in our schools. We're going to be looking to constantly watching the bills on telehealth because we did have emergency expansion passed this year and we need some sustainable bills with telehealth, especially with reimbursement. We're also constantly working on the reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid um, and for having our state license recognized and, um, and, and parity um, received for it. So it, it's, it's an exciting time as our profession constantly grows and we just need legislation to catch up with what we're doing and how we're doing it and catch up with already with the state boards issue us or certify us that we can do. Um, we are also going to start having our advocacy day in the summer as we've heard from many elected officials that that's the time that will work well because that's when the bills are being drafted. So having a better understanding of what they would like to do with the months and they've invited us to work with them through the committee, as well as then when the bills are about to come to the 10th session here in Maryland, it's a 90 day session where they're coming and the bill hearings are happening and then it comes to the vote. So we'll also still be engaged at that point as we know, committee is a smaller representation and then when it hits the House floor, the Senate floor, we want the masses of the members to understand how to vote on when it hits the floor. So we're looking to do a two-fold of our advocacy in the summer and then in the meeting session, which is a good So this year, Maryland just had a lot of success within the pandemic, within many of us in our profession being tired and working incredibly hard, servicing our fellow citizens and residents that we live amongst that are in need of help. So I just want to thank you for this time. And if you have any questions, um, hopefully they can be collected and then the advocacy team can answer them. Um, there is a successful way to have your advocacy day virtually. Um, and we are to meet with your members valuable conversations. So I want to thank the ACA team, specifically Dominique, for all of her hard work, our MCA president, 
Dr. McGinnis, and that's really led the charge and has given a lot of support to the advocacy committee so that we can do the things that we do. And the whole advocacy committee has done a great job in being able to inform our members, keep our members engaged, and come up with ways that we can really support our profession and make change. Thank you. Okay, great. So, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, Ronnie couldn't be here to answer questions, um, but I can try to take some of your questions. Um, I do want to loop back around to reciprocity. So, what we've seen um, and what I've heard in my meetings um, also with the Southern Region and um, with folks in uh, Southern states, rural states, states where uh, there's a tendency uh, to push against regulation uh, anyway, um, is that reciprocity really is catching on in some states like Florida um, or um, <clears throat> uh, Tennessee. There was a reciprocity, I think, Bill. Um, so what we want to do when we're meeting with representatives is really stress that these are not mutually exclusive uh, uh, bill languages or, or, or bills that they actually can support each other. In Maryland, for example, uh, we passed the compact as an emergency uh, bill, but the governor is well aware that until we have 10 states, uh, we can't even begin enactment. Uh, so they really wanted to focus on some telehealth language and reciprocity language uh, as a sort of a stopgap between uh, now and 2023, 2024, when we will have the compact up and running. Um, so these can be, um, you know, complementary. Uh, the, the end goal is the same. We want to increase access, remove barriers to services, uh, but how we do it is very different. Uh, so reciprocity is really kind of more of a regional solution um, where maybe um, uh, states that are neighboring each other might want to say, hey, uh, at the state board level or, or governor to governor, um, we want to recognize um, your licenses, offer reciprocity, um, increase um, our workforce, um, and they have that agreement, and that's um, great, and, it, and it's helpful um, to at the state level and maybe regional level. However, reciprocity can't really uh, ever be, um, from a legislative perspective, a sustainable solution to what is a systemic problem um, uh, because it, it, it's just not legislated. Um, and so it, um, it's more of an agreement uh, between administrations. Additionally, reciprocity doesn't have the same level of public safety. Um, so, and the same uh, sort of oversight. This isn't always the best sell in certain states like Florida that, or, or maybe West Virginia that might um, not be as interested in uh, high levels of public safety or um, that sort of anything that sounds kind of regulatory. Um, but the truth of the matter is that a compact offers that, so that commission, uh, that oversight, that uh, database. So um, one uh, tool that's useful in that situation also is to bring in the Department of Defense who is really backing the, the database and is really um, helping with that um, conversation. And they can talk about how for the military, um, you know, it is important to ensure that while they have a continuity of lifestyle that there's also this public safety mechanism and that we're able to um, track uh, licensure um, and we're able to have that space for dialogue between the states that a commission would provide. Reciprocity doesn't have those mechanisms. Uh, it's really just an agreement between states uh, to uh, allow practice. Um, it's not a, a sustainable compact. We're hoping um, in, in a compact uh, to create this mechanism that is lasting and sustainable and durable. Um, so if you think of a driver's license, for instance, how long has that been around? Well, that was a compact. Um, so it's really uh, fundamentally transforming the system versus uh, addressing a problem quickly that, um, you know, could change hands. Say the next governor doesn't like reciprocity, it's gone. Um, so um, the compact is a durable, sustainable tool for addressing this issue that really provides public safety mechanisms, oversight, um, and uh, a sustainable method for dealing with issues as they arise uh, through rulemaking through the commission. I hope that kind of makes sense. That does, thank you. I, I didn't know any of that really and how all that comes together. So now I understand what's 
the the, the all the excitement is about because that, that definitely sounds like a wonderful thing. Right, and you know, this is a common um, question. So I'm starting to think maybe um, I'll try to provide some more materials on reciprocity or maybe um, a specific training that just kind of talks about reciprocity, um, even if it's just like 20 minutes or so, um, I, I'll think about it. Um, but I do know that this is a really common question. So um, it's probably one of our biggest questions lately. Um, any other questions or concerns um, as we uh, reach the end of our uh, meeting today? Ah, silence. Um, okay, well, you can get more information at counselingcompact.org that has the toolkit, um, that has the final bill language, uh, that has templates, uh, infographics, talking points. Um, of course, you can reach me. I'll put my email address here um, in the thread, though all of you should have it. Um, you never know. So, um, and we are here to, to help you through the process. Some of the things that we've done for other states um, is we've, uh, in North Carolina, for example, we've set up a meeting between National Center of Interstate Compacts uh, and the local state board, because even though the board was favorable toward compacts, they had a lot of questions. Um, and then we had to follow up the meeting with uh, a few different letters, kind of giving clarity from a legislative perspective as to why we worded things a certain way. Um, so if you're getting into the weeds and you need help, uh, reach out to me um, and we can um, see what we can do to, to help at the state level. Oh, uh, Diana, you raised your hand. Uh, Dominique, will this uh, Zoom recording be available on the ACA website? That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say the website, but what I'm going to try to do, uh, figure out how to, uh, I've never done a recording on ACA Connect before, but I'm going to try to do it that way. Great. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Yeah. What about the subscription site? That would be a great place for it. On YouTube. On YouTube. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll talk to my team about that. Um, I'm not the uh, final say in what goes up on our YouTube channel, but I imagine um, they will be interested in, in putting something up on the compact. So I'll talk to them about that. Okay. Yeah, I think the word from the um, individuals in Georgia and in Maryland were really helpful. I agree. I think anybody working on this would, would appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I was so excited to have them hop on. And I know um, folks are really busy during the day. They're having their counseling sessions, um, supervision, et cetera. So uh, it was really great that they were, we were able to find a way to um, include their stories. Okay, thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thanks so much.